cover um, our last Sabbath shift example. My last Sabbath shift um, goal here is to be Um, and that class talks about both server and client-side scripting. We also have a class in mobile web development that gets a little more into JavaScript as well. And both of those would be good classes for you to continue from here, again, depending on, on what your goals are. But at any rate, today we're going to have our last JavaScript example. Um, Wednesday, what I want to do is I want that to be an all-work day. Um, I want you to bring what you're working on on your final project to class and um, take some time and show it to me and show it to other members of the class um, to get feedback. When, 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 you, when we do this, when people do this, um, you know, when people really truly make a sincere effort to do this, to take and share the stuff that they've done with their class, I think it benefits everyone all the way around. First of all, the person who is showing their project, they get a chance to get some feedback before it's turned in. Um, real web designers and developers don't operate in a vacuum. It's not as though they get a project, they work on it, disappear for two months, and come back with a completed website. At different points of the project, they're reviewing it with different people, and people review it, and people give their feedback. All right. There is, a, there is a sense that one can be too close to a problem sometimes to see, um, um, to, to really understand it completely or, or to, to, to see some things that maybe someone who has a little more distance and objectivity can miss. So, so the person who's doing the project benefits from getting feedback. Um, the person who is critiquing it benefits too for a couple reasons. First of all, um, they can perhaps get some ideas for their own project. Gee, I never thought of doing my navigation like that, or whatever. In addition, it is a good exercise to look at and to evaluate web pages um, on a deeper level than I like or I don't like this web page. All right. Um, the one thing I think I've, I've hoped to talk about in this class and to portray in this class is that when you look at web design, there's certainly aspects of it that are uh, subjective. In other words, I don't like that color. All right, well, you know, okay. That's fine. <laughs> uh, but, but most of evaluating web designs is less subjective than that. In other words, it would be one thing if I said I didn't like that shade of green. It would be another thing to say I don't think that shade, I don't think green is the appropriate color for this website due to the content, if, you, if you're following what I'm saying. You know, um, if you're doing, for example, a, a site for, um, you know, for um, a site that's very serious, you know, and you used pink and orange and bright colors, that probably wouldn't go very good. Um, that's different than saying I don't like those colors. For a different sort of website, for a website for kids, for example, bright, colorful colors might be something. But for an attor attorney, for example, bright, happy colors probably isn't the way you want to go. All right. And again, so that's, that goes deeper than a matter of personal preference. At any rate, by looking at and critiquing your classmates' work, um, it gives you a chance to practice that. And I hope when you look at websites from now on, you look at them and go beyond the I like, I don't like into what you don't like about it or why you think is a good site and, and how it um, manages the, uh, um, you know, the, the user's goals and the goals of the organization. So to, re to reiterate, um, Wednesday uh, is a day for you to work on your projects, bring your project to class to work on. Um, we'll go directly up to the lab, and you can work on them there, and show them to other people and get feedback uh, for them. Today we're having our last JavaScript example.
And what I want to do is I want to look at the examples that we did previously and build upon them. So let me go to Angel. pull down the examples that we had from last week. I will also post sometime this week information about final deadlines and all that now that the semester is coming to a close. So we'll spend a minute revisiting some of the ones that we did before. And I think the one that we did before was the form. It was the last one we left off on where we can submit to Bing search engine. If we omit to, if we omit a search term, it comes back with an error and it shows the error this way. If we do put something in, it then goes and calls the server side script to actually do the search. Let's spend a minute looking at that before we continue with the next example. In this case, notice that we have something a little bit different than what we did in the previous examples. The previous examples, we had our JavaScript really only in one place, and that is we had it associated with the event. So for example, on submit, we had a list of JavaScript statements. In this example, though, we have JavaScript statements there as well. But we also have some JavaScript statements defined in the head section. Specifically, what we have defined in the head section is a JavaScript function. Now, what do I mean by JavaScript function? A JavaScript function is where I take a set of JavaScript statements, group them together, give them a name, and then I can simply call that function wherever I want to do that block of statements. If we were doing this without a function, I would have a whole mess of statements as part of this on submit. Oops. I'd have a bunch of things within those quote marks for on submit. A giant string. And that would get to be very difficult to read. All right? And that would get in the way. With a function, I can go and I can say, all right, on submit, here's the stuff that we do this here. Now this is a very simple form. There's only one text box on it. But it still benefits to have this in a function because there's actually four or five lines of code that I want to do. Now if we added more stuff to the form, it would become even a greater benefit to have it in a function. So my function I give a name to. The parentheses indicate an argument, and there is no particular argument. You know, think of an argument as a parameter uh, of it, and we'll see an example of that later on. But all functions have uh, the potential to, to get arguments passed, so you always have to include the parentheses even if there's nothing in them. So that name corresponds to here, where we've defined the function. Up here in the script tag, we're simply defining the function. We're saying this is what this group of statements mean. So when you call, when someone, some point on the page, calls validate form, this is the stuff that gets done. 
So on submit, when we call validate form, this is the stuff that gets done. And what do we do? Well, the statements that we have here aren't radically different than what we've seen before with just a couple of twists. Twist number one is that we have an if statement. Previously, the JavaScript statements that we did simply were executed with no questions asked. If you remember, like when we changed the image, we had an on-click event, and we changed the image to something else. Or we made something visible, or we made something invisible. All right. In this case, we have an if statement. And we look to see if document, all right, somewhere on the page, get element by ID Q, all right, that's that text box here. If its value equals nothing, that's two quotes right next to each other, then we got a problem, right? Because they're trying to do a search on something, but they haven't entered in their term. So what do we do? Well, these two, these, these last two statements, or these two statements here, should look pretty familiar. We find the element on the page called label Q, and we set the font weight to bold. We find the same thing on the page, and we set the color to red. So that's why when we go and run this, we don't put anything in here. That label becomes bold and red. The other thing that we do is we set the inner HTML. What is the inner HTML? Well, just as the name implies, it is the stuff between the start and end tag, the inner part of it, the HTML in between the start and end tag, the inner HTML. We set that equal to a message, which is please enter a search term. So nothing there. We set that red. We make it bold, and we put in a line that says, please enter a search term in there. Which is already red and bold, because we set the style of that error message area to be red and bold and bigger than the surrounding text. Now, the one other thing that's a little bit different is we return a value. Now, functions um, can accept arguments, which we'll see an example of in a minute. Functions can also return an answer. All right? You might have, for example, a function that um, takes an employee's hours. Or let's, say, let's say we're doing a simple tip calculator. You take the cost of the meal that you put in a text box, and when you click a button, it multiplies it by 15% to give you a suggestion about what kind of tip to leave. All right? In that case, we might have a function to do that calculation. And in this case, the answer of the function is going to be the amount of the tip. You know, if you had a $20 meal and you wanted to tip 15%, the 15% would be um, $3. All right? Now, in this case, this isn't returning a number answer. This is returning whether the, for, whether the form is valid or not. In other words, whether it passes the validation or not. Now, if this condition is true, and there is nothing in that text box, then we return a false, because that form is not valid. That return, then, comes back to here, and this return effectively notifies the onSubmit method that, hey, there's a problem with this form, so cancel out of the submit. So we use a return value here to pass back to this, on, to this onSubmit event what happened. That is, is the form valid or not? And if it's valid, we continue. If it's not, we stop. We cancel out of the submitting form. All right. So that's a review of what we did last time. Again, notice that this example, and our examples are getting a little more difficult each time. We're adding more and more stuff to them. But we're still following the very basic formula. And that is, there's a user event, like an on-click, on-submit, on-mouse-over. 
And that triggers some sort of action to happen. That triggers some sort of JavaScript. This is the whole notion of the page being interactive. All right? That is, the user does something, the page responds to that. All right? Um, and how does it respond to it? It responds to it by using the document object model to point to the different things on the page and to change them. So anything you can set via CSS or any HTML attribute that you have, we can actually go in and change that via our JavaScript. So in other words, that label initially was normal size text and black text. We're able to make it bold and red if there's nothing entered simply by using the DOM to point to that label and saying we want to change the style, we want to change the font weight of it, and we want to change the color of it. It's advantageous in this case to do this validation client side. Why? Because remember, that JavaScript gets downloaded with the rest of the page. So when I request a page, I get not just the HTML and CSS, but the JavaScript as well. Which means that that's already on my computer. So if I click the Submit button, that JavaScript code is going to run instantaneously as opposed to if I do things via server-side scripting where I would have to send a request to, through the internet to the web server, ask the web server to do something to me, and send back a response. So the whole idea of client-side scripting is we can put things in there that cause the page to change, and we can do that, make the page change instantaneously, simply because the JavaScript, along with the HTML and CSS, gets downloaded when someone initially requests the page. So it doesn't have to go through the internet to make that change. All right, let's go back to our bird example. We had a couple bird examples let's look at. Let's look at this one, as good as any. We could actually do it on all of them, right? Because they're only different, if I'm not mistaken, by their CSS. And we saw this example before. So when the user puts their mouse over this, we see a new image. All right? Let's take a look at that code. We have our CSS. We have a section for the thumbnails. We have our big image, which initially is picture one. We have our three or four thumbnails. And on mouse over, we go and we point to this image and we change the SRC attribute to the other images, the bigger versions of the image, one, two, three, and four. Again, anything that we can set via HTML or CSS, we can change via JavaScript. In, in this example, yeah, in this example, the thumbnails, I actually physically went in and resized them. And again, you know, there, there's various approaches you can take. In this case, my assumption was, well, I don't want to download all the big images right away. I want to just download the thumbnails, the smaller versions of the image. And to be frank, that's typically how I do it. I typically actually make a physical thumbnail for it. But again, notice that, well, I point to that thing on the page with an ID of big, and I change the SRC attribute. So this matches that. That's not a coincidence. 
I'm telling it to go in and take whatever I originally coded that source to be and get rid of it and replace it with this new source. All right. Now, let's say that I wanted next to the image a block of text describing the image. All right, and I wanted a different block of text for each um, image. So I wanted to like tell a little story that like, you know, here's the mama bird sitting in the nest on the eggs. All right, here's the baby birds. They're hatched and the mom is feeding them. Here the mom leaves the baby birds alone to get out and relax a bit because it's tough being a mama bird. And then finally, the empty nest. Everyone's grown up and can leave the nest. So let's say I want a little narration of that as well. All right. Again, let's think of how we can use CSS, HTML, and JavaScript to make this work. The little paragraphs that are going to describe that all right, are HTML. All right. I'm going to have a paragraph of text about the one bird, a paragraph of text about the next, or about the one image rather, a paragraph of text about the next image, the third image, and finally the fourth image. So I'm going to have four paragraphs. All right. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to create a section here. Because there's, there's, this is a section, yeah. This is a section, and then that's a section. So I'm going to make a section, I'm going to make another one. If you, and I'm going to put my four different paragraphs in here. I'm going to do this, and in each step, I'm going to take a look at it and make sure it's the way I want it to be. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to define this and All right, so I should have the HTML and the style sheet for these, for the most part. All right, there we go. All right, now I don't want to show all these at the same time, right? I want to make them appear one at a time. 
all right? Now, let's, we can think about this. In fact, we can play around with this a little bit, all right? Let's say initially, though, I want to make them disappear and show, them, show only the one that's relevant. So what I can do is I can do this. Right? I can go in here and I can make make image two, three, and four invisible. There's a couple ways I can do that. I could say visibility hidden, or I can say display none. I'm going to say display none because when you say display, or when you say visibility hidden, it still takes up the space, you just can't see it. Whereas if you say display none, it doesn't take up any empty space on the page. So there. There's the first image and the first block of text. Now the problem is, is it doesn't change. So let's do these one at a time. Let's go in and let's make the second one work. The second part sort of works, right? The image switches, but it doesn't switch the text. All right? So what am I going to want to do here? On mouse over. On number two. Well, I could say that I, well, here's what I want to do. Document get element by ID. I want to hide one, so I'll take image one and hide it. And I want to take image two, the paragraph image two, and show it. So there, the first picture shows, the first text shows. There is a problem. Yeah, you're right. There should be parentheses. Not the square bracket. Now, we could more or less, if, if we did not notice that, we could do this and go up under Tools and look for JavaScript Console, and it would kind of tell us it. Not really, though. It says can't read property, and we look at that line, and it'll show us kind of what's wrong with it. but not exactly. All right, there we go. Now, of course, when we go back, it doesn't change it back. And when we go to this one, it doesn't change it. And when we go to this one, it doesn't change it. So, could like do this. That works, but 
Now three and four still don't work with the tax. So if I did that, I'd have to go in and copy that chunk of code and then actually add three and four to both those places. And I'd have to have all four of them hide all the divs and then show the one that we want to show. Then the problem comes in, what if I added a fifth picture or a sixth picture or if I had a hundred pictures or whatever? It'd really get into a mess. This is where software development is, is a good career choice for lazy folks, all right? Because, it provides us the right kind of laziness, all right? Because it's actually good if you can take a solution that takes less time and effort to do because, well, it takes less time and effort, for one thing, but more importantly than that, it takes less time to change. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat. If we notice here, we have a block of code that is more or less repeated each time. All right? What are we going to do? When we're all done with this, what are we going to do? We're going to have code that changes the image from whatever it was to the new image, hides all the paragraphs except for one, and then it shows the paragraph that we want. So that's what our code is going to look like. This is what we want to do in all four cases. We want to swap the image. We then want to hide proper paragraphs. And then we want to show the correct paragraph. So when the user puts their mouse over thumbnail one, we want to show image one, hide paragraph two, paragraph three, in paragraph four, and then show paragraph one. What do we want to do if they put their mouse over image two? We want to show image two. We want to hide paragraph one, paragraph three, paragraph four, and then show paragraph two. For three, we want to show image three, hide paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph four, and then finally show paragraph three. And then number four is the same way. In other words, we're doing the same instructions, but we're doing them to slightly different things. In fact, we could, I hesitate to say the word cheat, but we could cheat a little if we wanted to and say, this is what we want to do. I want to swap the image to whichever image is appropriate. I want to hide all the paragraphs. Then I want to show paragraph, whatever the name of the paragraph I want to show is. I want to do that in all, for all four thumbnails. And if I added five more thumbnails, I'd want to do it for all of them too. Now the only thing that's going to be different, and I could write a function for each one of these. I could do this. I could write a function
that's named shall first pick paragraph. And I could do exactly what I described here. I could call that function on click. Show first pick paragraph. All right. Now we're using our function to do that. Now, that didn't address the other three ones, right? Well, I could go in and I could create a second function. And a third function. fourth function. Just by tweaking them a bit. And now I have four functions. Repeat, please. Oh, thanks. And that shows you one of the problems with this approach, right? You're doing the same tedious thing over and over again, you're liable to make mistakes. All right? But if I didn't make any other mistakes, this should work. Now, what's the problem with this? Let's do a thought experiment. What if I were to add a fifth picture? What would I have to do? Well, I'd have to add the fifth picture, add the fifth paragraph. Okay, that's not that big a deal. All right, or the fifth thumbnail, the fifth paragraph. 
I'd have to go in and create a new function, show fifth picture, and I'd have to go back and change all my other four functions. All right. And then if you go sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth thumbnail, you know, it escalates from there. I think I mentioned that when we back we talked about external style sheets that one of the programmers slogans is DRY, do not repeat yourself. If you notice here, these functions are identical except for two things. Number one, what image we set. And number two, which one of these we make displayed by setting it black. So, what I can do is I can actually simplify this by passing in two arguments. Now, what are arguments? Arguments are the things are like placeholders. In other words, this is a placeholder. This is going to get filled in with something different each time. This is a placeholder. This is going to get filled in with something different each time. So I want to show a different bigger image, and I want to show a different paragraph. I want to make a different paragraph visible. Now I'm going to go and move this down here. We'll talk about why in a second. So all I have to do to make this work is, and get rid of these other functions now, is to tell when I call this function what specific image I want it to show and what specific paragraph I want to show. So I'm going to put in image to show, the word image to show there, comma, paragraph to show. And I'm going to fill those blanks with the arguments now instead of hard coding it. All right? So whatever is in image to show, I'm going to use that to show the proper image. Whatever's in paragraph to show, that is the ID I'm going to use. Now, we haven't talked about how we're going to give values to these things. These things are variables. In other words, they, they have a different value. They could potentially have a different value each time. Notice they're not included in quotes because we want the value of the variable. What we haven't talked about is how to get a variable in or a, a value into that variable. Now, I'm going to go, just to make my life easier, I'm going to go and hide all of them first and then show the one that I want to. So, this means that for a brief second I'm going to hide the one that I want to show, but then I show it again. So, and it's not even a second. It would be microseconds. Now, how do I change my code? Well, I no longer have these four paragraphs or four functions. I have one function, but I have to give that function the information it needs. So when I put my mouse over image one, what image do I want to show? I want to show one.jpg. What paragraph do I want to show? I want to show the paragraph that has an ID of image one. I think that's what I called it. Yeah. So now, when I go and do this, still works. From the end user's perspective, they don't see anything different, right? What do they see that's different? Well, they see um, 
or yeah, they don't see anything different. But what is different about this? What's different about this is how much easier this is to change and how I don't run into the possibility of copying and pasting like I did before and changing the wrong thing. So if I wanted to add another image in here, what would I have to do? Well, I'd have to add the new thumbnail, of course. I'd have to add the new paragraph, of course. Then I'd just have to add two lines to this function. I wouldn't have to go and create a whole new function. All right, I'd just add another line to it to, to you know, um, I'm sorry, I'd have to add one line. You're absolutely right. I was, I got confused for a second. Right, you'd only have to add one line to it. Very good. And I'd have to add a line to the style sheet. Now, the nice thing here about the separation is let's think about each element of this page and the role it performs. HTML is the content. It's all the images and all the paragraphs. CSS is the appearance. All right? It says which paragraph we're going to see and which paragraph we're not going to see. Or, probably better put, it shows us, well, what, how, we're how differently we're going to show the paragraphs that were that, uh, for the active picture. Right now, I'm hiding them. I could do something else with that, right? I could maybe make the paragraph that I'm viewing bold instead of hiding it. And then the JavaScript makes it interactive. That is, it goes and it changes things. So let's go in and let's say someone says to me, hey, I don't want to make these invisible. I want to make all of them visible. But when the user puts their mouse on one, I want to make that one bold. OK. I should be able to very easily go and change that by going in and saying, font weight normal. Then I just change my JavaScript. Instead of saying display none, I say style. So I could do this simply by tweaking the HTML and JavaScript. I could represent this different way. So notice that, that the first thing is bold. So I put my mouse over that. The second thing becomes bold. Third thing becomes bold. Fourth thing goes, becomes bold. HTML hasn't changed, right? Why? Because no content has changed here. What has changed is the way that I'm displaying the content, all right? In other words, initially I'm not hiding things anymore. I'm simply making one of them bold and the other normal way. And what also changes how I am changing it based on the user's action. In other words, I'm no longer hiding and displaying things. Therefore, I'm making bold and I'm making unbold. So again, you know, you could do a lot of different things with this if you wanted to. You could, for example, you know, put a border around the one that the user had last moused over to, 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 to keep that clear if there was any confusion about that. All right. But again, it's these three different technologies coming together, each responsible for one aspect of the page and a clean separation of them that allows us this sort of flexibility. So I don't like this. I want to go back the way it is before. I don't have to touch any HTML. I just touch the CSS of how it initially gets displayed 
and I touch the JavaScript on how I want the interaction to work. All right, questions on this? Remember, Wednesday is a work day. Bring your work stuff to work on your final project to lab and be ready and willing to show it to people to get feedback. All right, we'll see you up in lab.